Hello and welcome to another episode of my Portraits of the Landscape video series. This is part two of my photographic trip into Chernobyl's exclusion zone, the 1,000 square mile contaminated area around the Chernobyl power plant, which forced the evacuation of over 70 settlements after the worst nuclear accident in history. In my last episode, I took you along with me in the planning for my trip to this devastated wasteland as I photographed the area near Chernobyl town, the secret military installation and the Duga radar, and the vicinity to the plant itself. In this episode, we will journey together to the city of Pripyat, the closest settlement to the nuclear power plant, a city of 50,000 people, filled with the hope and promise of the future, yet snuffed out virtually overnight after the accident. Located a mere four kilometers from the power plant, the city of Pripyat was founded in 1970 as a home for the facility's workers and their families. Some of the Soviet Union's youngest and brightest minds worked at the plant, with the average age being only about 26 to 27. As such, most were just starting their families. In developing Pripyat, the Soviets tried to create a model city to entice them to stay and build their career complete with a large number of schools, sports and recreational facilities, cultural centers, and even an amusement park. Once a bustling center of freshly poured concrete structures, today Pripyat lays abandoned, taken over by greenery and the resilience of nature. The grand building is now slowly deliquescing back to the soil. It now stands eerily silent, but for the ghosts whose stories yearn to be told. As I travel a great deal meeting people across the country, I fear that we have forgotten the horrors of the Chernobyl disaster. Most of the younger generation are not aware of the event that affected so many around the world. My primary goal of this photo trip was to capture portraits to bring back and share with those who have forgotten or those who may have never known, so that we may always be aware of the cost of our mistakes. I would not be making portraits of people, however. Instead, I would seek to capture portraits of those left behind, the inanimate objects left in haste and the powerful stories that they can share with us. Pripyat is located within the zone of alienation. Using the power plant as the epicenter, everything within a 10 kilometer radius is deemed uninhabitable. This 10 kilometer radius within the 30 kilometer exclusion zone has its own checkpoint and control access. This area was so highly contaminated that experts say it may remain uninhabitable for at least 2,000 more years. The ambient radiation levels here vary considerably even within a very short distance of mere feet. Hence why a Geiger counter and a guide who knows the hotspots is invaluable and essential to have. As we drive the bumpy, weathered road into the city, we are surrounded by trees and brush. Left to their own devices to flourish in the absence of weed whackers, pruning shears, and lawnmowers, one had to look closely to see the concrete buildings obfuscated by the thick density of reclamation. Many of the 50,000 residents lived in one of the city's 160 apartment blocks. Once they dominated the skyline, now most are hidden behind a forest of trees. I notice a fruit tree with apples on display. As enticing as they may look, the soil from which they've grown is contaminated, reminding me of the underlying danger hiding in plain sight here. We pass by a fire station once home to the brave first responders of the disaster. One wonders if they truly understood the hell that had been unleashed at the power plant before bravely charging over to quell the fire at the reactor. The building looked as exhausted today as to how the firefighters must have felt during the frantic time back in 1986. Those first responders were some of the first patients that would soon overwhelm Pripyat's lone hospital. The healthcare facility could accommodate just over 400 patients at the time, and along with its three supporting clinics, would be put to the test beyond what they were prepared for. It was essential for me to stop there so that I could capture some portraits. The buildings of Pripyat are quite dangerous to enter. Not only has the ravages of time and neglect permeated many of the roofs and sped up their decomposition, rendering them structurally unsound, but most of the construction utilized asbestos insulation, which is evident throughout. While it's not usually visible to the naked eye, a high-powered flashlight would reveal airborne particulates in many of the structures, something I definitely did not want to be breathing in. 
My research alerted me to this possibility, so I came equipped with a ventilator and a Tyvek suit. It was more than a little unpleasant to photograph this way, but I thought it best to be safe. I would also utilize my chest mounted camera pack so as to ensure that my camera equipment would not have to touch the ground whilst I was in the city. I had my heavy duty Hanwag hiking boots for protection from debris which was everywhere. Where the asbestos levels were high, my boots would be safely shrouded inside my Tyvek booties. My tripod legs would unavoidably become in contact with the ground so I had to have a supply of wet wipes to wipe them down each evening back in my hotel. The asbestos in the hospital was particularly bad. Plus, since the facility saw so much activity immediately after the explosion, it received significant exposure to contaminated patients and clothing. So much so, that after the evacuation, the highly contaminated debris was stored in the hospital basement and then filled with concrete to prevent anyone from entering and being exposed to the residue. Inside, I felt an immediate chill sweep over me. Hospitals are usually awash with activity, the air alive with beeps and buzzers of monitors and intercom announcements. Here, there was nothing but silence, a deathly quiet. As I walked from room to room, that hospital silence was only broken by the crunch of debris under my feet. Debris from decomposing ceiling tiles losing their battle against holding back heavy, wet insulation, paint chips from peeling walls, broken glass. My mind would race as I composed each portrait. My brain would try to recreate what it must have been like in the room during the time. The frenzy, the growing awareness of the scale of the disaster, the underlying panic, the fear. I at first thought it was my subconscious, but I now strongly feel it was the ghosts. A sobering reminder came when I entered the maternity Pripyat was filled with young people, just starting their families, and rooms filled with bassinets and incubators made my stomach clench at the thought of so many newborns, so close to so much contamination. One of my main goals of being in this area was to photograph the impact of the disaster on the human element. What was life truly like here before that devastating day? A sign atop one of the buildings proudly reads, Let the atom be a worker not a soldier, proclaiming the peaceful use of nuclear energy. Ironically, it would be the atom that would disrupt the peace of this community forever. Inside the apartments, I am greeted by thick shards of peeling paint reaching for me from the walls. It is both beautiful and melancholic at the same time. Elevators, once busily transporting the residents to and from their homes, now stand motionless in retirement. When Pripyat was evacuated days after the accident, its residents were told that the departure was temporary. This was likely believed by most involved, including the authorities that perhaps didn't truly understand the gravity of the situation. As such, most of their personal belongings remained. Although the exclusion zone was locked down and guarded, eventually over time, items that had any value were looted. I suspect this happened heavily around the time of the fall of the Soviet Union when Ukraine was breaking free of the Union and had to take over responsibility for the zone. Visiting three decades after the disaster, most of the items left had no value, were heavily vandalized and or destroyed by neglect and decomposition. Most contained some degree of contamination. The infrastructure to support a population of near 50,000 meant that many would find work outside of the power plant. There were markets, cafes, shops, offices, factories, numerous opportunities to contribute to society. This store once sold small appliances in the heart of the city. Now it's surrounded by the forest. This old cash register caught my eye. Once it kept busy ringing up sales in a shop, now it slowly ceases from heavy corrosion. 
I took a bit of artistic liberty with this composition and utilized my guide who uses electronic cigarettes to fill the empty cash box with a puff of vapor to emphasize its dusty, long forgotten appearance. In the offices, important engineering drawings were being drawn up for projects that would never be built. Reports were run that would never be analyzed. A frozen clock reminding of deadlines that would never be met. Important calls never to be made as workers clamored for the exits. A once busy manufacturing floor in a factory now occupied by a tree. Grown from a seedling carried by the wind through a broken window or perhaps from the perforated roof down through a collapsing ceiling. The abacus was a common fixture I saw while exploring the city. This basic version of a calculator has been in use since ancient Egypt and perhaps foreshadowed some of the technological hurdles that faced the Soviet Union during the 1980s. Signs of Soviet pride could be found throughout the city. Here, a room filled with propaganda and political portraits lay amongst piles of signage and refuse. Peeling emblems of the Olympic torch and rings remind those of the summer games which had occurred just six years before in Moscow. Sports were very important to the people of Pripyat, with numerous recreational facilities found throughout the city. One of the most impressive in its day was the Azure Swimming Pool. Azure was centrally located and sported an enormous Olympic-sized pool with a 10-meter diving tower, all next to a picturesque two-story wall of window. The windows once looked out to the downtown area, but now it is surrounded by a resilient forest eager to take over. The building also houses a large gymnasium whose floor has succumbed to the ravages of neglect. It becomes obvious when walking about the building that there was a great emphasis on not only staying fit, but also excelling in athleticism. There aren't too many local gyms in North America that have pommel horses to work out on. Although the relative population of Pripyat was quite small, that didn't stop them from having a professional soccer team and their own stadium. Stroytel Pripyat Football Club played at the newly built Avonhard Stadium. Ironically, the team had just celebrated its strongest season ever, finishing second in the league in the season just prior to the disaster. 30 years after the team played its last game, the pitch is no longer visible, having been overtaken completely by trees. The stands that once held thousands of cheering supporters, now slowly rotting away. Another area for recreational sporting was Energetic, a Soviet palace of culture. The Soviet palace was a social meeting spot for the community and were found in most major cities across the Union. In addition to another indoor pool and gymnasium, the center had a boxing ring, movie theater, and several meeting areas for clubs and art classes. The movie theater drew my interest particularly the projection room. There I saw the remnants of old 35 millimeter movie film discarded in a clump on the floor. Studying the emulsion, I could see images on each frame and wondered what movie it held in the silver halide. I wanted to capture a portrait of this film. The negatives were color that had long faded. As I studied the subject for a composition, I found that the color would be far less impactful than if I had shot it in black and white. I changed my mindset for the monochrome composition, then carefully composed tightly to emphasize the waves and flow of the film's curvature. I then adjusted my angle to get a slight glistening of light on the emulsion side to breathe a bit of light into the dying film. I was much happier with the result than if I had rendered it in color. To emphasize the idea of community, 
The Palace of Culture featured a beautiful large mural in its main foyer. The painting depicted a grouping of local men and women embracing. I simply must capture a portrait of this poignant piece. No doubt the community came together tightly in the frenzied events days after the disaster. I would find more magnificent murals in the city. Wondrous works that depicted pride and achievement, sadly with no one left to appreciate and be inspired by them. In the numerous works I saw, the Soviets' fascination with space exploration was evident, truly contributing a sense of national pride. The arts were also important in everyday life in Pripyat. An art school provided a center to learn and attend various disciplines of performing and visual arts. Even the building was a work of art, a mosaic of tile flowing over contours. In the lobby of the art center, I encountered this magnificent piece, a red chair, sitting quietly, alone against a crumbling wall surrounded by a floor of debris. Missing its cushions, it was a mere shadow of its once grandeur as a place of comfort whilst awaiting a night at the opera. Unusual for me, I opted to center the composition as any offset placement of my subject would have compromised the impact. This simple yet powerful image would become my favorite from the entire trip to the exclusion zone. Further inside, a concert hall and performance stage. I was drawn to a practice room where I found the remains of a vandalized grand piano, its portrait I must make. I studied the room and the piano's place in it. I wanted to record its fate, succumbing to a losing fight to nature that had entered a broken window and slowly crossing the floor toward it. Plus, its wounds from vandalism, a sad attribute many items I would find would suffer from. I found this composition the most impactful to tell its story. Music was everywhere in Pripyat. I would encounter many pianos in different buildings, even a retail store that specialized in them. Once again, the ghost would race inside my head, imagining the hands that touched the keys and the joy they once brought. An icon for the city towers above the impeding tree line that has since descended around its base, a Ferris wheel. Part of an amusement park that was preparing for opening on May Day, May 1st, 1986, a mere five days after the explosion at the reactor. A place designed for family fun and to leave the stresses of life behind, never had the chance to bring those gifts to the residents. The Ferris wheel, struggling to rise above the newly sprouted forest below. Its capsules not able to transport fairgoers for a bird's eye view over the lovely new city. Bumper cars also reside here, impatiently waiting for over three decades for riders that will never come, the sound of laughter never to fill the air. Road warriors fighting a losing battle against time The Dish was a popular cafe along the Pripyat River, offering a meeting place with friends in one of the more scenic locations in the city. Now it struggles to be seen as nature slowly engulfs it in greenery. Inside, two-story floor-to-ceiling windows once afforded spectacular views over the Pripyat waterway, where one could watch boats passing by whilst enjoying a cup of coffee and perhaps a baked treat. Now the view resembles more of a cabin retreat deep in the forest. An incredible stained glass installation filled the floor to ceiling window in another part of the cafe. The light of day which once placed a spotlight on the wonderful artistry has now been obscured by trees and brush. The toil of hard winters and neglect eating away at the window seals. 
eventually leading to the dislodging of panels. What was once an amazing work of art that brought pleasure to the locals is rapidly being reduced to a scramble of shards on the weathered floor below. Pripyat is a living monument of a city that was filled with promise and hope, but erased due to a foolish mistake that brought in insurmountable consequence. The events that happened here were tragic for so many, on so many levels. As such, this is a place that should be treated with the utmost in respect and reverence. It is for this reason that I was absolutely sickened to find graffiti and vandalism present here. Although there are numerous inspection checkpoints into the zone, ne'er-do-wells find their way in and many do leave their mark for all to see. This is all about vanity, especially in this age of Instagramming and self-absorption. Many of these people may have accomplished artistic skill, but at the end of the day, defacing property that is not yours and was not granted permission is nothing more than common vandalism. Doing it inside a place of great significance as this makes me rage with anger. Lord help those I ever come across engaging in this activity. As I mentioned before, Pripyat was built with young families in mind. The city was comprised of five secondary schools, which saw the education needs of almost 7,000 students. Inside, classrooms remain filled with empty desks, their occupants long gone. Science class projects left in mid-study. School gymnasiums, silent and dark. Libraries littered with books, their knowledge discarded in heaps on the floor. A store of crates in a back room held reminders of the Cold War era. Scores of gas masks on hand in the event of a very different kind of danger. A nuclear missile attack. Ironically, the source of the nuclear threat would be very different. These stores of masks would be found throughout the public spaces of the city in all sizes. Probably the most difficult places to visit in Pripyat were some of the 15 kindergartens and nurseries, each a place filled with the next generation, eager to live, eager to learn. Once brimming with inquisitive minds, screams of delight and infectious laughter, these places, like the others I visited, all mute in an eerie silence. At times, the silence is so extreme it feels like someone is holding thick pillows compressed against my ears. I actually found myself saying something just to remind myself that I could hear. Once again, as I form compositions, the ghost would get inside my head and reproduce the laughter that once happened inside these walls. One image that will always be deeply ingrained from my visit is this one. A nursery filled with cribs, laying under a ceiling of stalactites. A growth of mineral-laced rocksicles formed as moisture works its way from the roof three stories overhead down through the floors above. It was surreal and more than a little unsettling. After shooting in the Chernobyl exclusion zone for a week, and the constant engagement with the many ghosts that reside here, I was mentally worn out. Even in sleep, it was hard to quiet my mind. I had captured many stories of loss here, and nothing had quite prepared me for the emotions I experienced. Now it was time to return home and share the images, stories, and experience I had so that others do not forget what happened here, and how quickly life as we know it can change. I hope you enjoyed this episode of Portraits of the Landscape. If you did, 
please give the video a thumbs up below, share the link with your friends, and don't forget to subscribe to my channel to see future episodes when they are posted. Thanks so much for watching. See you in the landscape.